Today's topic is one of the more complex of the topics at A-level physics. And while the ideas behind it are simple, the applications can get quite complicated. So please do ask any questions that you might have in the comments section. Do practice as many of these questions as you can find so you can see the applications. I will make another video where I go through some of the past paper questions so that you can see the sort of thing that you'll have to deal with. When we looked at force on a charged particle or force on a wire, we used Fleming's left-hand rule, which is this picture that you see here and should be familiar to you at this point. Now, with those applications, we supply the current and we supply the magnetic field. So the current through a wire sitting inside the magnetic field produces a force upwards. And these three factors here are inextricably interlinked in this whole magnetic fields topic. With the wire, current carrying wire in the field, we get a force. However, you can think of it like what would happen if you supply the force in a magnetic field, we should be able to get current out of that. And of course, current is only supplied when there's a potential difference or an EMF across a some kind of circuit. So in order to get that current, we need to somehow gather positive charges and negative charges separated away from each other so that the negative charges can flow from one side to the other. So this is what electromagnetic induction is about. It's about supplying the force on a conductor in a magnetic field and getting, in the end, current out of it. The principle of it is this. You take a piece of wire and normally, practically, this is a loop of wire because there are various factors that we're going to discuss in a second, but take a loop of wire and you move a magnet some way around that loop of wire. Now again, in a previous video, I referenced flux and flux linkage. So let's just revise that for a second. Flux is essentially the magnetic field lines. And we know that flux is equal to the magnetic flux density times the area. So when we think about how much flux there is, we need to think about how strong the magnet is, and therefore how strong its magnetic field is, and the area that this magnetic field is covering. Now, flux linkage is not given its own symbol. It's given the symbol n times phi, because flux linkage tells you how many lines of flux might be linked with a piece of wire. So if you look at the end loop here on this coil, we're talking about how many magnetic fields, field lines go through that loop. And if we're just going to look at it in its most basic sense, we could physically just count these lines. One, two, three, four, five. So we could say in its most basic sense that there are five lines of flux linked with this loop. And of course, those lines of flux are linked with all the loops that are in this coil. And this is where the n comes in. The n is the number of turns that you have on your coil, where, and the flux, of course, is the magnetic field strength times the area of the coil. So this is starting to tell us what kind of things might influence what happens here. So let's talk first about what happens here. When you move this magnet, what you find is you get a reading on a galvanometer down here. Now, a galvanometer is basically just a generic meter. It tells you the presence of either EMF or current. And of course, we would get current here if we have an EMF because we've got a complete circuit. So when you move the magnet in and out, you get a reading on this galvanometer. When you move it in, the reading will flick in one direction. And when you pull it out, the reading will flick in the other direction. And that's because when there is a change in the flux linkage between this magnet and this coil, you get an EMF induced in the coil. And that is electromagnetic induction. That was the great discovery of Michael Faraday. And so the law of this is named after him. Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. If the magnet is not moving, while you may have flux linked with a loop or all the loops of the coil, you get nothing. That's because it depends on the change in the flux linkage, and it depends on the rate of change of flux linkage. And we will come back to that in just a moment.
Let's talk for a moment about why an EMF is induced in the coil and in which direction that EMF might be. So if you imagine this tube that I've drawn here, this is a piece of wire. And what is happening is it's being dragged through a magnetic field that is into the page. So get your Fleming's left hand rule ready, as we're going to be using it. If you exert a force on this wire and you pull it towards the right, with Fleming's left hand rule, our first finger, the index finger, points in the direction of the field. So we're going to point our index finger into the screen here. We know that the second finger points in the direction of the current. And here you must be very careful, because if you look at the electrons in the wire, those electrons, when you pull the wire, are going to travel to the right, which means current is towards the left. So when you point your finger into the screen, your middle finger should point over to the left-hand side. And your thumb, then, points in the direction of the force on those electrons in that wire, just like we had with F equals BQV and indeed F equals BIL. So our electrons are going to experience a force downwards along here, which means they're going to collect at the bottom end of the wire, making the bottom end of the wire negative and therefore leaving the top end of the wire positive. And so that gives you the direction of your EMF. You've essentially produced a tiny little battery here just by dragging the wire through the magnetic field. If you connected that with an external wire, then of course current would flow from positive to negative along in that direction. Just like we've said before, what influences the size of this force is going to be the speed at which you move the wire through the field. BQV, remember. So, and also the strength of the field. So this connects back into what we were saying about electromagnetic induction and the fact that you must move the magnet relative to the coil in order to get this EMF being produced. Back we go to our loop, and remember, this is a very simplified way of thinking about it, so that you understand why the EMF is being induced. There are, of course, all sorts of ways to engineer EMF being induced, engineer either the movement of the coil or the movement of the magnet in order to get this relative motion between the two so that you get a change in flux linkage. So remember that flux is B times A, and flux linkage is the flux times the number of loops in your coil. So of course, flux linkage, which is given this symbol N phi, doesn't have one by itself, remember, will be N times B times A. These basically tell you the factors that are going to affect how much EMF you get. Because the change in flux linkage is what produces our EMF. So our EMF that is induced, that's the correct term for it, is going to be dependent on the number of turns in your coil, the strength of your magnetic field, and the area of your coil. These are the three factors at first, but remember, the change in flux linkage produces the EMF, but if you can change the flux linkage faster, you're going to get a greater EMF, so it also depends on how quickly it changes. In reality, how fast you move this magnet. And so, officially, Faraday's law is expressed as EMF is equal to dNVA over dT. You also see it written as dN phi dT, but of course we know that phi is B times A. To all intents and purposes, because we do not need to be able to differentiate, although most of us are, can of course do that by the time you get to A-level physics, but to all intents and purposes this equation becomes NBA over T provided that you know the time it took between the start of the change and the end of the change. Now, the direction of the induced EMF is very important, because that's going to determine the direction of the current. And in a loop like this, if you have an EMF induced, you're going to get a current because you have a complete circuit. The problem, of course, with putting a current through a coil of wire is that putting a current through a coil of wire makes the coil a magnet itself. And so let's look at a scenario whereby we had different directions of current passing through the coil. And there's a little shortcut that you can use to determine the direction of the magnetic field produced when you pass current through a coil like this. If you imagine looking 
from the front of that magnet right down the loop and so you're seeing a circle. If the current is going clockwise, that means that a south pole will be produced on the right-hand side of this coil. If the current is going anti-clockwise, you can see the handy little diagram you can draw, then that means that that will be a north pole. So here lies the complication. As you move the magnet in, you're going to induce an EMF, and you're going to produce a current in that coil. Now suppose you produced a clockwise current in that coil, and therefore there was a south pole there and a north pole there. That means that that end of that coil would attract the magnet. And that means that it would accelerate it slightly towards the coil, which would increase the rate of change of flux linkage, because it would now be moving faster, which would increase the EMF being induced, increase the current, make the magnetic field around the coil stronger, so make that south pole stronger, which would attract the magnet more, which would increase the EMF induced, and hopefully you start to see that you start to get energy being produced from nothing. And that is impossible because the law of conservation of energy forbids it. So instead, always, what is produced at the end of this coil is a north pole. If you move the magnet towards the coil, you get a north pole there because it tries to repel the incoming north pole of the magnet. Funnily enough, if you pull the coil out, the poles of your loop will switch, giving you a south pole at the right-hand end because it tries to attract the magnet back. This is why, like we said at the beginning, our EMF seems to switch direction depending on whether you bring the magnet into the coil or you pull the magnet out of the coil. Because at all times, the EMF that is induced tries to oppose whatever it is that's causing itself to be produced, because the law of conservation of energy must apply. And if it didn't, if the EMF was in the opposite direction, we'd be generating energy from nowhere. So this is a separate law, this opposition law. It's sometimes called the law of contrariness. Its official name is Lenz's law. And what Lenz's law does is it adds a minus into our equation. That's all. But you do need to appreciate that Lenz's law comes from conservation of energy. And you also need to be able to say which pole would be produced on the end of a loop like that. And as a consequence of that, which direction the current is moving in the loop. This is how all electricity, apart from photovoltaic cells, this is how all electricity in the world is being produced at the moment. Because no matter what happens, you are spinning some form of turbine. And that turbine is usually attached to a magnet, and that magnet is, has a coil sitting around it. And as you spin the magnet, you change the flux linkage with that coil, you induce an EMF, and you produce a current because you have a full circuit. This is very often a six mark question. There are lots of applications of it. You need to be able to work with this. And like I say, I will dig out some past paper questions and do them as a video so that you can see the kind of thing that you're expected to either say if it's a written question or calculate if it's a calculation question.